A fine suit has become a status symbol for the modern man. Whether it's Armani, Hugo Boss, or Men's Warehouse, finding the right suit to fit your style is an imperative. The price of a suit can vary anywhere from a couple hundred to several thousand dollars. But what if you skip the brand names and find tailors and just try to make a suit yourself entirely from scratch? Well, that's what I'm gonna find out. For my suit, I'm gonna try a variety of different materials as well as methods to make them. My plan is hemp pants, cotton shirt, a wool vest, alpaca felt jacket, and a silk tie. First up for my pants, I'll need to find a source of hemp. Because of its relation to marijuana, hemp farming is still restricted in many parts of the US, even though it has no drug-inducing capabilities. One of the few states that allows hemp farming is Colorado, which is where I'm headed to join in on a hemp festival. As a part of their festival, Laughlin Farms invited people from all around the country to participate in the hand harvesting of his hemp. I'm Ryan Laughlin, and I'm a Colorado hemp farmer. This is our second year of growing industrial hemp on a commercial scale. We have four acres right over here planted, and we just had two acres we harvested yesterday, and we're going to harvest the four acres today. The first field Ryan was having us help with, he was harvesting the heads to collect the seeds. These seeds would then be used for growing next year's crops. This is 24 years I've been working wow. on being ready for our first hemp harvest, and it's happened today. Yeah! After helping collect some of the seeds, I then started collecting the part of the plant I was here for the stalks. After collecting the stalks, they are submerged in water for several days in a process called water redding. Once redded, the stalks need to be broken up using a handbrake, breaking the hard inner herd section from the bass fibers, which I'm after. So this is a magnificent machine. It was uh, what known as the hardest job known to man. It's one of the few jobs that they actually paid some slaves to actually do. Uh, you know, they, uh, once they worked over their quota, they paid them, you know, by the pound and some of the young slaves were able to buy their freedom by actually breaking hemp down. A few hours of work, i able to uh, somewhat process a fair amount of hemp fiber. I have no idea how much I really need, so I'm just kind of, I'm hoping this will be enough. It uh, feels like it weighs a little bit more than a pair of pants. This whole experience is pretty interesting. I didn't really know what to expect, but I got to try a lot of hemp products I never knew existed. Could try hemp tea, hemp coffee, hemp beer, hemp burgers, just a bunch of hemp clothing. A lot of advocates here for hemp. Just people are just full of knowledge, like all of the different ways it can be used and the, the medical benefits of it and how it's a really interesting crop that has a lot of potential in a lot of different areas. It's kind of cool to be able to participate in what's the forefront of the legalization of this whole new industry and to see what what this could take off to. And uh, Ryan here is kind of one of the first pioneers and he's kind of paving the way for this new industry. So it's, it's kind of interesting to see it at this point. But uh, I'm just gonna make some pants. <laughs> Next, I need to get cotton for my shirt. But since cotton only grows in the South in a region called the Cotton Belt, it's time to take another trip. This time to the largest cotton growing region in the world, West Texas. All right, so after an early flight this morning, I'm in West Texas, about 80 miles south of Lubbock. I have never actually seen cotton field before. So this just looks weird. It's a bunch of little shrubs just growing cotton balls. Before I even arrived, I learned that the timing of the cotton harvest is highly dependent on the weather. A rain several days before I got there threatened to prevent me from being able to pick anything. I feel like I picked a lot more than just this. After collecting my cotton by hand, I was taken over to another field where the farmers were actually machine harvesting. Here, I got to see the amazing speed in which an entire field can be harvested in a day by just a handful of people. Hoping for the chance to drive one of the cotton pickers, I thought they might let me take a turn. But unfortunately, they were in such a rush to get the field picked by the end of the day, I didn't even have a chance to ask. The three cotton picker machines go row by row, clearing the cotton. Once full, they dump their load into the following bowl buggy. The bull buggy then dumps the cotton into the cotton module builder, which uses the hydraulic compactor to compact the cotton into one solid module. Once full, the module builder pulls away, revealing the cotton module, ready for pickup, where it'll be taken to the cotton gin next. At the cotton gin, I was given a tour of the process by which the cotton lint is separated. The gin dries the cotton, 
separates any dirt, sticks, or other foreign objects, and uses small sharp blades to grab the cotton fiber, pulling it from the seeds, separating them. Then the isolated cotton fibers are collected, bundled into bales, and shipped out. Nia Sarah is able to see the, the full size one in action. Uh, now they have this small scale one so I can gin just my cotton. So after using the cotton gin, got several bags of cotton, separated cotton seeds and all the other junk from it. Now I just have just the part that I want, the cotton lint. Should be ready to be spun into a fabric next. Unfortunately, I, I never end up having the chance to drive one of the cotton machines that I was really hoping to. It's kind of a childhood dream of mine, but uh, I was able to find the next best thing. Hello there. I wanted to talk to you for a couple of minutes about the history of cotton harvest. First, there's Maybe it was a good thing they didn't let me drive the actual machine. For my sweater, I was able to find a local sheep ranch willing to let me shear one of their sheep. The first step is getting the sheep on the ground, which is a lot harder than you'd think. back up just a little bit to let her roll down. Jim explained how it's important to make sure you get the wool in a single swipe. Otherwise, you end up with double cuts, which makes the fiber hard to spin. So I, I sheared a sheep, and uh, you can probably tell which one he is. He's the one with the really lopsided haircut. But I have my wool, and next step is spinning. Spinning is the art of twisting fiber to make string or yarn. By twisting fibers together, many short strands of fiber can be made into a longer, stronger thread. I got some help from Susan Hensel, a local fiber artist. She took me to her basement to show me how to prep my wool for spinning. First, she showed me how to wash the wool to remove the waxy lanolin that covers the sheep's wool. In the sun. Look how fluffy that is now. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a little bit of a difference. Yeah, like a whole lot of difference. <laughs> After washing, the next step is carding the wool. Now, the wool is ready to be spun. I want you to get a little more twist in your leader here. Here's what you're gonna do. The end of your leader, you're gonna lay onto your preparation, and then you're going to start drafting forward. So you're gonna go pretty slowly. The wool doesn't need a tremendous amount of twist in it to hold together. Mm -hmm. Just pinching a little bit of fiber and pulling forward. I feel it slide in my fingers. You are spinning, my dear. Huh. Is that lovely or what? After showing me how to spin wool, Susan then showed me how to spin cotton, which presented an extra challenge because of its very short fibers. It needs to be spun very tightly. You need lots and lots of twists per inch. Lastly, she showed me how to spin hemp, which, with its very long fibers, presented the opposite issue of the cotton. So it's actually very easy to spin. That what you have to watch is how many fibers are going in so you're consistent. Mm -hmm. Just a few fibers from there first, yeah. Yeah, like that. With the help of Susan, I eventually got the hang of spinning and was able to spin all my fibers into thread, which next I'll need to weave to turn it into cloth. For help with that, I met with an experienced weaver, Judy. The first step was to set up the warp, the vertical strands of the weave, which ended up being the most time-consuming and daunting task. Through the next slot. You realize this is only half the process. Half of the weaving process? Or no, half? half of the warping process. Oh. All right, I'm done. Except the whole weaving part. I still gotta do that. <laughs>
The next step was the actual weaving. The simple loom I was using allows a quick switch for the up and down positions, creating a simple weave pattern. I spent many hours over the next week finishing the weave. Once I mastered weaving my hemp on the simple loom, Judy moved me on to the more complex floor loom to weave my cotton. I used a four-step tool pattern, which required me to step on four different paddles in a row to create a pattern compared to the simple up and down pattern I originally used on the hemp. Yet again, setting up the warp was really difficult, but once set, I could weave really quickly and had it done in a mere 12 hours. With my weave complete, the last step was to cut the finished textile from the loom. For my wool, however, I thought I'd try an alternative method to weaving that only requires a pair of needles, knitting. To learn how, I found a local knitting group to teach me how to knit. Am I doing this right? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> While I finish up knitting my sweater, I want to get the material for my tie started, silk. So thanks to the internet, I was able to order a batch of silkworm eggs online. Putting them in a warm, dark environment, they would eventually hatch in a few days, emerging barely the size of a grain of rice. Worms required a strict meal of only mulberry leaves, which I fed to them from a dried powder. With a little water, it turns into a yummy paste the little guys love. Over the next few weeks, it would get bigger and bigger as I fed them more and more. So it's been about 28 days since my silkworms first hatched. It's about time they should start cocooning. I guess before they start to cocoon, they're gonna like give a really messy poop. <laughs> That's kind of the sign that they're about ready to cocoon. So I'm gonna watch out for that and then start transferring them into toilet paper rolls and that's gonna be what they cocoon in because they like a dark, isolated spot. So I start out with these very tiny, I can barely even see them, and now they're just growing exponentially and it's been kind of fun to watch them grow. Just every day check up on them as they like double in size each day and now they're pretty massive compared with how they started out. Well, the silkworms finish maturing, there's still one last fiber I need to collect for the largest part of my suit, the jacket. So, I'm off to an alpaca farm. And then use your fingertips so you can't grip it. If you do it like this, you can't feel the animal. Okay. If you leave it light, it just goes like this. Okay. That's exactly right. That's good. That's all you need for that. Okay. All right. I sheared my first alpaca. Yeah. I'll let you guys take care of the rest. <laughs> to turn this alpaca fiber into cloth, I tried a method called felting. After combing the hairs into bats, I laid the hair out on bubble wrap, which the hairs wouldn't stick to. Then I sprayed them with a soapy water until they were damp. Sandwiched with another layer of bubble wrap, I rolled them up, and then vigorously rolled them back and forth. The alpaca hairs have tiny scales on them, and when matted and pressed against each other, they can interlock and form a solid material. After repeating that step a few times, it should be fully felted and formed into a solid piece. Compared to my other methods of turning fiber into cloth, felting was by far the easiest method, and in the end only took a fraction of the time as spinning and weaving or knitting did. Back to my silkworms, they were finally starting to cocoon. Over the course of a day, they will wrap themselves in almost a mile worth of thread. The unfortunate fact about silkworm raising is that if you allow the cocoons to fully develop and the moths to emerge, they'll burrow through the thread, making it impossible to reel. So after a month of getting attached to my little guys, they'd have to be stifled with my oven. However, I did spare a few cocoons, as I was curious to see the last stage of the life cycle, the silk moth. Unfortunately, the fate is not much better. Emerging without even a mouth, all they do is mate, lay eggs, and die after three days. Through centuries of domestication, they aren't even capable of flying more than a few feet. Back to my other cocoons, I cleared the outer short fibers from them. Then the cocoons need to be soaked in hot water to release the end of the threads. So I have all the cocoons.
spoons here by what I hope is the one long thread that makes up most of them. So now I'm going to combine them all into one thread and then wrap it around a toilet paper roll and hopefully they'll just all unravel and I'll have one nice long strong strand of silk. After reeling the silk for an afternoon, the silk thread was ready. After 10 months of work, I finally have my completed suit. I have to say, I completely underestimate just how difficult making your own clothing actually is. I thought making a sandwich was hard, but this is to a whole other extreme. The level of skills I needed to learn and hours to invest. In the end, this suit directly cost me over $1,500 to make. But if I paid myself minimum wage for the nearly 300 hours of work that went into it, this suit is worth almost four grand. But I think the quality speaks for itself. <sighs> it's getting really hot in here. Oof. Okay, so even with all that work, I, I might have run a little short on material. <laughs> While my suit was a bit short of complete, I'm actually in the middle of revisiting that topic of clothing and focusing instead on making one complete item, a printed t-shirt. With my suit, it involved travel to several different states to harvest all the fibers. This time, I'm going to stay local and grow all the crops myself which require a fair deal of indoor and hydroponic growing for the cotton I have planned. With cotton's extra long growth cycle and extra challenges of growing it this far north, this project is likely to become one of our longest and most time consuming projects yet. And we're still a good several months from actually completing it. If you want to see us complete larger, more time consuming projects like this one or more, consider supporting us on Patreon. Or you can also support us by buying one of our t-shirts through Spreadshirt. They're made through a slightly more efficient method than mine.